first deployed in the early 50s, the B-52 was the Strategic Air Command's primary weapon of deterrence, which range enabled worldwide deployment of Sachs nuclear arson. Today, the B-52 is flown in low-level Bonnie and electronic warfare role. When it went into service in 1955, the B-52 was the pinnacle of jet bomber design. But its genesis can be traced to a decision made by the Department of Defense 10 years earlier, when the nation was at war. Throughout much of World War II, America was committed to the development of proven technology because this would enable production lines to churn out the tools of war with the urgency needed. The Fiston Tower Plank drove every American aircraft that served in the fierce air battles of World War II. Even the massive Boeing B-29, which had more speed, range, and payload than any other bomb, still depended upon Fkusten engine technology. A B-29 was thought to be the ultimate in aviation, but in fact, its high technological stink was soon rendered obsolete by a new breed of aircraft. Early in the war, it came as a major shock for the United States to learn that Germany and Britain had developed gas turbine jet engines that would soon be able to propel fighters at speeds far faster than the fabled superforkers. In 1944, the American Army Air Force issued a requirement for an all-jet bomber fast enough to elude jet fighters. Contracts were issued for no less than five different designs. But it took another technological mark, nuclear fission, to bring the war to a quick and dramatic end. Although a B-29 was employed to carry the weapon, just one aircraft dropped one bomb, and in seconds, the city of Hiroshima ceased to exist. If one aircraft could carry such a devastating payload, then perhaps large fleets of bombers would no longer be needed to win a modern war. The dreadful cost in lives that America had paid to establish island B-29 bases in the Pacific had changed the parameters for the next generation of bombers. During the early post-war period, strategy concentrated on the ability to deliver the atomic bomb over very long distances, and the Air Force put its emphasis on long-range intercontinental aircraft, a role that the Convair B-36 Peacemaker adequately filled for some time. The giant B-36 was really a Second World War design that arrived too late for combat. It required no less than six massive piston engines to propel it at what were average speeds. However, jet engines were later fitted in pods under the wing to supplement its power. By 1947, the jet bomber project was starting to come to fruition. In that year, five submissions were tested, although by now they were classed as medium bombers. The B-45 was the first of the jets from the 1944 requirement, and it was the second most successful. This simple but effective four-engine design was actually adopted by the Air Force and went into service in limited numbers, though mainly in the reconnaissance role. Consolidated offered the B-46 as another four-engine jet bomber. Its clean limes made it one of the most elegant aircraft of the time, and its performance as an early jet was quite acceptable. However, Consolidated was heavily committed to B-36 production, and the medium bomber project was not given a high priority. 
The B-48, designed by Martin, was a cumbersome aircraft that employed six jet engines in mid-wing clusters. About the most impressive technology it offered was its bicycle undercarriage, placed on the center line of the aircraft and supported by two outrigger wheels on each wing. This project did not tempt the Air Force, and like the B-46, the prototype was scrapped. Northrop, in an attempt to compete in the jet bomber program, took its previously piston-engine flying wing and equipped it with eight turbojets. The wing was a brilliant design that offered excellent efficiency. It was years ahead of its time. Perhaps because it was so different, it never seemed to attract government approval. The technological grasp that Northrop had of flying wings paid off 40 years later in the form of the B-2 stealth bomb. Today, the B-2's wing is a symbol of cutting-edge aviation design. The most impressive design offered to the Air Force came from Boeing. Their B-47 Stratojet design benefited from the manufacturer's analysis of German data on swept wing technology. To obtain the maximum efficiency these wings could provide, they were made extremely thin and flexible. Therefore, their six engines had to be suspended on pylons and spread across each wing. This approach made servicing the engines easier. It also had aerodynamic benefits for the aircraft at speed. Because the wing was so thin, Boeing used the same fuselage-mounted bicycle undercarriage as Martin's D-48. The B-47 was adopted by the Air Force, and literally hundreds were produced during the early 50s. It was, by any standard, a very successful designing, a classic case of having the right design at the right time. But it was also an ideal testbed for Boeing to gain experience on the production of the efficient swept wing jerk bombers. In an attempt to keep the Peacemaker project alive, Convair produced an all jet swept wing version given the model number XB60. However, the revamping of an aircraft originally designed in the Second World War did not impress the Air Force. As far back as 1946, Bowling had been commissioned to develop a replacement for the Peacemaker. The company explored hundreds of different concepts, ranging from ultra-large piston engine aircraft to those using proposed compound supercharged power plants and others with turboprops, jet engines driving propellers. But nothing provided the dramatic increase in performance over the B-36 that the Air Force was looking for when the efficiency of the B-47's full-swept wing became apparent. Boeing proposed another all-jet design, based loosely on its medium donor, but larger. This idea was refined on model 464-67 and was ultimately accepted by the Air Force as the B-52. An order for two prototypes, the X and Y models, was placed in October 1948. But due to minor problems with the X model, the YB-52 was ready first. Here, the YB-52 undergoes tests at Edwards Air Force Base. Its overall shape and fighter-like canopy was similar to the B-47, but its size and performance was much greater. The B-52 also had many updated features, like an all-steerable undercarriage, but adjusted to face forward on landing, even when the aircraft was pulling to one side. This feature was top secret for several years. Apart from the cockpit layout, which was changed to a conventional side-by-side -side airliner arrangement, there was very little external difference between the prototypes and the B-52s that ran into production. Quark began in earnest on the B-52A, now named the Spratofortos. Only three B-52A models were built, but the Plea model, which was identical to the 52A except for minor improvements, went into full production. In-flight refueling which had been perfected in the late 1940s by Boeing's flying bomb men, had solved many problems. However, in the early days of the B-52 project, in-flight refueling was tricky at best. The early aerial tankers were powered by piston engines with a maximum speed little more than the stalling speed of the jet bombers. Jet tanker refueling was obviously preferable and safer. It was only with the arrival of the KC-135 Stratotanker that aerial refueling became relatively safe and practical. 
One other method of increasing range was the adoption of extra-large outboard wind tanks, like this example, which can hold 3,000 gallons and can be jettisoned in a combat situation. By March 1954, B-52s were rolling off Pauling's production line in Seattle. The planes then went into an induction program, where aircrew and aircraft were blended into one fighting machine. Inside this sleek shape, crews of six men learned the ways of the Stratofortress. After the B-36, they found Bowling's bomber much more cramped. Every available inch had been dedicated to fuel, payload, and electronics. Where the Peacemaker had no less than six gun positions, the B-52 had only one. The plane relied on its performance and the new science of radar jamming for its self-defense. The Strategic Air Command had to have the world's best bomber. The Strategic Air Command made the same heavy demands of its crews that it did of its new B-52 bombers. Crew members were trained until they became an elite corps of professionals, forming a team equal to the sophisticated new aircraft they flew. For over ten years, the Stratofortress and its crew had one primary responsibility carrying and delivering the thermonuclear hydrogen bomb. But if the bomb was to be carried as a deterrent, it had to be tested to prove its potential. Throughout the 1950s, hydrogen bombs were detonated in remote Pacific region. To these men, loading the most destructive device ever conceived by the human mind is a matter of precision and routine. A specialist falling just for the highly trained benefits of the Strategic Air Command team. Each cargo has a 100 megaton yield, 100 times greater than the boss dropped on Japan. Unlike the weapons of the Second World War, the device carried in this bomb bay will be slowed in its crop from the B 52 by a parachute, allowing the bomber more time to vacate the area before the cataclysmic explosion. Fearing a Soviet atomic attack, America set up an elaborate array of early detection facilities during the Cold War years. The early warning systems were based mainly in the frozen north, the most likely route of a first strike. Radar watchers constantly monitored scanners that probed the sky, looking for the blip that might signal the beginning of World War III. The Strategic Air Command had fleets of B-52s on operational standby in a constant state of alert, ready to act as the ultimate deterrent if needed. When the red shone rain, the procedure was automatic, but to 100 straddle fortresses could be dispatched in a few short minutes. The routine was finely tuned by regular exercise. The concept of an instant retaliatory strike by SAC was seen as a nation's best defense during the Cold War years. The business of nuclear deterrence was trusted only to carefully screened officers. All nuclear-armed B-52 pilots held at least the rank of major. They bore the heavy responsibility of commanding aircraft that could change or even end life's on Earth. By the early 1960s, ground-to-air missiles had been perfected by the U.S. and the Soviets, to the point where massive nuclear bombardment by aircraft would be difficult to achieve. The emphasis had shifted to another form of delivery, intercontinental ballistic missiles. The B-52, used in conjunction with Hound Dog standoff bombs, provided a flexible alternative. B-52s could proceed to the very edge of enemy airspace signaling America's readiness to attack, but still providing time for last-minute negotiations. The B-52's effectiveness was further increased by the development of a quail decoy, which confused enemy radar by mimicking a Stratofortress radio suit. Further development after the Hound Dog produced a SRAM missile, small and able to be carried in greater numbers. The SRAM could be guided from within the B-52, to targets up to 100 miles away with devastating accuracy. In 1965, the B-52 was used for the first time in Vietnam. 
Now it carried conventional bombs instead of nuclear warheads, but it remained a deadly weapon. The wing mounts now carried 24 500-pound iron bombs. The internal bomb load brought the total payload of each plane up to a total bomb load of 108. During the course of the Stato Fortress's involvement in Southeast Asia, B-52s dropped in excess of 3 million tons of bombs. Although the use of the high-flying bombers was controversial at the time, there is little doubt that the Stratel Fortress was very effective when used for conventional bombing. Many historians argue that the heavy bombing of North Vietnam during the linebacker operations pushed the enemy back to the negotiating table and eventually resulted in ceasefire. During other Vietnam operations, more sophisticated bombs were dropped. Some could be detonated later by personnel in other aircraft using infrared viewing equipment to coincide an explosion with enemy activity. Standard 500 and 750 pound iron bombs like these were used on most B-52 raids. To facilitate quick loading and turnaround, the internal bomb load was contained in pre-arranged racks so they could be installed in the shortest possible time. Wu's initially based at Guam prepare for the long eight-hour flight to their distant target. During the long years of the Vietnam War, nose art was drawn on more than a few B-52s. Although the art was tamer than its Second World War counterpart, the missions flown were no less hazardous. B-52 crews had to cope with fast and agile enemy MiGs, anti-aircraft guns, and worst of all, deadly surface-to-air missiles. Despite it all, they had missions to perform, and like all soldiers, they flew regardless of opposition. After a raid, ground crews hurriedly repaired the bullet-whittled airframes of returned stratofortresses, priming them for the next mission. Despite the low fuel takeoff policy, the heavy weight of the bomb load put tremendous stress on the engines, which regularly needed maintenance and often replacement. MiGs were kept at bay and sometimes shot down by rear gunners, who in their lonely outposts employed a radar-aimed remote-controlled array of four cannons with devastating firepower. The tail gunner's position was deleted with the arrival of the B-52G and H models. All B-52 G and H models are equipped with EVS, Electronic Visual Systems. So this enables the pilot and other crew members to see what is ahead of the aircraft, even in darkness and fog, via infrared television cameras and a monitor. This development came just in time, as the role of the B-52 has changed to that of a low-level tactical bomber. With the B-52 shielded by radiation-proof curtains, the EVS is the crew's only visual link to the oxide world. But though the mission has changed, red phones and flashing lights are still the currency of SAC. From a bell rings in exercise or in war, SAC's awesome deterrent force swings into action. The first thing a general in charge of operations will do is vacate his ground base for the safety and mobility of an aerial command zone. At the same time we have is given, air crews rush to their aircraft, which are always on standby for instant action. The general is airborne, and the B-52s are close behind. It is only in the safety of the air that SAC's deterrent force can survive an attack and at the same time be on their way to deliver a response. The high-speed takeoff is a prerequisite to survival. B-52 
In this exercise, the prospect of a nuclear flash is provided for, and the radiation resistance curtains are put into place. Now the crew is totally dependent on the EVS and other electronic aids, for they dare not look out of a cockpit. Flying low over the ground, each pilot awaits his orders. This time, the B-52s are called back, but all concerned know that they have the capability to go into enemy territory if required. After almost 40 years of service, the B-52 still performs its mission well. Almost as soon as the first B-52 rolled off the assembly line, the Strategic Air Command was searching for a replacement. First came the ill-fated XB-70, an advanced design that was considered outmoded by ground-to-air missile technology. More recently, there was the swing-wing B-1 bomber developed by Rockwell International. The B-1 provided a combination of high speed and altitude with the wing-swept ACK, a more economical low-level flying with the wings form. However, the cost of deploying large numbers of B-1s was not acceptable to the Carter administration, and the project was shelved throughout the 70s. In the 1980s, the revamped B-1B went into production not in the high-altitude role, but as a low-level bomber. Approximately 100 B-1Bs have been deployed by the Strategic Air Command. The plane is costly, but if the V-1B equals the overall performance and value for money that its predecessor, the V-52, so clearly achieved, it's money well spent.